So I'm Kevin McGee. I don't know how many people here have seen me talk before. Okay, at least one, maybe two, three, four, five, okay. Um, so usually I talk about shipwrecks and things like that, scuba diving, that sort of thing. Today, I'm talking about eclipses. Now, a disclaimer, I am not an astronomer, but I do like astronomy, so that's good enough. This is a total eclipse, and this is what we hope to see on April 8th. And I think everybody's heard about the news now, right? It's gotten out. There, there will be an eclipse on April 8th, as scheduled. And this is the path it's going to take across the United States. There's some things about this eclipse that make it a little bit different from other solar eclipses, which, by the way, are not very common. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but you can see that Cleveland is very prominently scheduled right smack in the middle of that eclipse trail in totality. And that makes it unique, at least for us. Uh, in the sense that that doesn't happen very often. So let's zoom in a little bit. Here is actually Ohio. And of course we have Cleveland right here. And you can see we're almost in the center of totality. We're just a little off to the side. That's really good placement. Excellent placement as a matter of fact. Uh, if you haven't heard the details, it starts at 2 p.m. on Monday, April 8th. It's going to hit totality starting around 3.13 in the afternoon and go for uh, until about 3.17-ish. And then it'll, uh, the total eclipse will uh, end after the 317 time period. Then it'll be a partial eclipse, eventually ending around 430. So it's a two and a half hour event. And of course, the highlight of the event is totality itself. And it's long. It's actually almost four minutes long. Three minutes, 50 seconds, three minutes, 52 seconds. Depends on where you're at. Uh, even three minutes, 53, 54, if you go a little bit to our west. But nevertheless, it's a long eclipse. Uh, most eclipses don't last that long. If you miss this one, you're going to have to wait till 2444 in about 420 years for the next eclipse in Cleveland. So if wow. just wait around, it'll eventually happen. But it'll be a while, so don't hold your breath. So that's the next time it will happen in Cleveland. So this is momentous. This is actually a really important time. And before I talk about the eclipse, I want to talk about this. Does anybody recognize what this is? Because you should always start at the beginning. No, it is not the moon. Close. It's Thea. Thea is the hypothetical ancient body that was in the solar system when it was first created about 4.6 billion years ago. And it was a, they think it was an Earth Trojan, roughly Martian size. And it was actually in one of the Lagrange points, either ahead or behind us, probably ahead of us, L3 or L4. And uh, in the same orbit as Earth, in a Trojan orbit. Uh, a lot of the big gas giants have Trojan asteroids, and they kind of collect in these what's called Lagrange points, which are semi-stable points ahead and behind. That's actually, by the way, where we put the Webb Space Telescope was in a Lagrange point, because uh, you can kind of keep them there easier. And unfortunately, it got a little unstable, and it probably spiraled in and did a head-on collision with Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth was only about 100 million years old at that time, if that. And that collision resulted in ejected debris, uh, that eventually coalesced to form the moon. And uh, that's, by the way, called the giant impact hypothesis. And it's well proven. In fact, a good portion of the Apollo flights was to prove this. Most of what we know, there was all sorts of conjectures of where the move came from. After Apollo, they were pretty much all thrown out because the evidence very closely matches this. So there was this impact. And this is a look of what it probably looked like. It was a, a <laughs> literally an earth-shattering event. It was a world-destroying event completely destroyed both bodies when these two came together. And it created this enormous debris cloud around the Earth. Uh, the Earth was pretty much all molten at that point. Earth 1.0, 1.0 was gone along with Thea, and the combined parts of both of them formed both the Moon and the Earth. Most of that debris rained back down onto Earth 2.0, and formed what we know today as Earth. We have no idea what Earth 1.0 looked like because it was completely obliterated in the collision. And the remainder, what little left is in orbit, coalesced to form our Moon. And that's where our Earth-Moon system has come from. And by the way, this is an actual photo taken by the Galileo spacecraft on its way to Jupiter. They had to do a couple of gravity assists. And its last gravity assist around Earth, it took the shot as it was leaving. Here you can see the Moon. It's actually in the foreground, not behind the Earth. And here's Earth, and they got both objects in one shot. Uh, it's not a composite photo. And 
One really cool thing about Earth that I don't think people fully appreciate, but Earth is the only rocky planet in our solar system with a substantial moon. Now I'm ignoring Mars, which has two very small asteroid looking like moons around it, Phobos and Devos. Uh, but they're little tiny chunks of rock, they're not round, and they're actually in an unstable orbit. They're going to spiral in and, and collide with Mars eh, in a few billion years, pretty soon. But nevertheless, our moon is in a stable orbit, it's round, and that's not anything Mercury can say, Venus can say, or Mars can say. Now Jupiter and Saturn and all the gas giants have dozens of moons, but Earth is the only inner solar system planet with a moon. And that's kind of special. Now you may be asked, why am I talking about the moon? Well, because without the moon, there wouldn't be any eclipses. The moon is the essential ingredient for eclipses. So this is eclipses. What are they? Well, there's two different types. You have the lunar type and the solar type. The solar type is when the moon gets between the sun and the earth and casts a shadow on the earth. A little tiny shadow there. And a lunar eclipse is pretty much the same situation, but it gets behind the earth and now the earth's shadow blocks the moon. So that's the two different types of eclipses. And let's talk a little bit more about lunar eclipses first, before we get into solar. So this is a lunar eclipse. On average, it happens about twice a year, but some years none happen, and sometimes as many as three happen. It's seen more often than solar eclipses. It's a more common, commonly observed thing. Um, you may ask why, we'll get into that in a bit. But mostly it's because Earth's shadow is so much bigger than the Moon's shadow. When the Moon's around the front, only a tiny portion of the population sees that, that full solar eclipse. In the backside, everybody on the nighttime side of the, the Earth can see it. And the Earth has a so much bigger shadow than the Moon, therefore lunar eclipses observe more often, even though solar eclipses actually happen more often than lunar eclipses do. And there's two shadows, which we'll be talking a little bit about, so a little bit of terminology here, but nothing too hard. You have the umbra, which we call the full shadow. And that is where if you're in the umbra, you cannot see the sun at all. You are in complete shadow. However, if you're in the penumbra, then that means you're in kind of the partial shadow. You can still see part of the sun's disk. Uh, it's not fully in shade. But you, what you would see is a partial eclipse, essentially. You can see just a sliver of the sun. But you're, you're dimmer because you're not getting the full sun. So those are the two different types of shadows. And this is a penumbral lunar eclipse. Exciting, isn't it? it? It really isn't. So this is when the moon only passes into the penumbra, and it's not in the umbra. And it's a very subtle darkening of the moon. You can see up here it's just a little bit dark, but not much. The moon does subtly dim, but it's really, really hard and difficult to notice and observe. In fact, most people don't even know it's happening. That's subtle. And as a result, it is kind of boring. Uh, astronomers care, but nobody else really does. Ah. But now, what happens when the moon goes into the umbra? Now the moon starts to actually turn red. And it's, you can see this is probably a partial. Down here it's still in the penumbra. But here, the top portion and the middle portion of the moon is in the umbra. And it's red, which is kind of weird. Now, a full eclipse, by the way, is called a blood moon. The entire moon turns red, which is really cool. Actually, it's something that is actually very explainable, but ancient people didn't know that. So why is it turning red? Anybody have any ideas? It's optics, uh, basic optics. What it is is as the moon goes behind the earth and gets into the umbra, sunlight gets through the atmosphere and the atmosphere acts as a prism and it just separates out the normal light into all the colors of the rainbow. Blue and violet are bent the least, and then green and yellow and red the long wavelength is bent the most. And it just gets bent around behind the Earth and into the umbra, and that's why the moon's red. It's just being illuminated by essentially a red spotlight that surrounds the Earth. And of course, you need an atmosphere to do that. There is no solar eclipse equivalent because the moon has no atmosphere. So you're not going to see red cast on the Earth. But you will see red cast on the moon. Now, the next graphic I really like because it shows it from something no human has ever seen before. What if you were standing on the moon and a lunar eclipse happened, a full lunar eclipse, what would you see? And so here we have no eclipse, the moon's not in the shadow at all, and you can see that rainbow effect coming off of the atmosphere. And you can see blues bent very little, greens and yellows more, reds and oranges the most. 
And it's actually the same physics that gives us sunsets. That's why we have pretty sunsets. That's why you see reds and golds and, and yellows toward as the sun gets lower. And finally, it's red right before the sun sets. This is the exact same phenomena. It's just light being bent through our atmosphere. And normally what happens is the uh, moon, if you're standing on the moon's surface, all you'd see is white light. You'd see the sun and the earth together. And then what happens is you start to pass into the penumbra. You start to get into the blues and the violets. And you'd see the earth kind of ringed in blue, same color we see in the sky normally. And as it goes a little further in, it starts getting yellow. Now the earth is ringed in yellow as it gets a little further in. And the really cool part is when you're in full total eclipse, if you were standing on the moon, you would see Earth as a big disk surrounded by a red glowing ring, which that's really cool. Uh, no human has ever seen that, but if there were creatures that lived on the moon, I guarantee you they would have all sorts of cultural phenomena and explanations about it. And speaking of which, humans seeing a moon turn red has caused all sorts of cultural things to happen. It's had a large impact on humans and, and myths and all sorts of things. I mean, think about it. You're standing there and this moon that you're normally used to suddenly goes from the normal color to a pale color to a bright red color. That's frightening. I mean, that's usually a god in the sky. You have no idea about astronomy and that there's a separate body out there. You don't even know the distances. For all you know, it's just a thousand feet up there. You don't even know the distance to the moon. And when you suddenly see it turn red, a blood red, that, that's kind of scary. And it's had a very dramatic effect on people, uh, causing lots of fear and dread throughout history. Lunar eclipses have caused a lot of chaos. So think about it. There's um, usually most people, and this is kind of weird, most of the world actually thinks of eclipses as an animal of some type or a creature of some type eating the moon. It seems universal. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, it's pretty much the explanation. And it sometimes might be, uh, the Egyptians, it was a sow, a pig, swallowing the moon. For both the Mayan and the Incan, it was a jaguar eating the moon. Uh, for China, it was a mythological three-legged toad uh, called uh, Chan Chu eating the moon. And that's only some portions of China. Other portions of China, it was a dragon eating the moon. Or in other places of the world, it was a demon eating the moon. But it always seems to be pretty much something is eating the moon. Uh, that, that's pretty universal for a full uh, lunar eclipse. And what do you do about this? I mean, you can't just let this stand. What do you do? And again, the, the reaction seems to be pretty universal. You start throwing things at it and making lots of noise to scare it away. It wasn't unusual to start throwing stones at the sky, shouting, cursing at the sky, uh, throwing spirits, shooting arrows in the sky, which you would think would not be a good idea, but they did it. China, banging drums, ringing bells, banging pots and pans, was shooting off fireworks, was usually the reaction when an eclipse happened. And even as late as the 1800s, even when they knew better, the Chinese Navy would still fire its artillery in tradition of scaring away the dragon or whatever was eating the moon. Um, that was, it's so culturally ingrained that they just did it whenever they saw an eclipse, which is weird. And here's the dragon coming by and there's the disc. It's a red disc, so you could guess it could be the full, uh, full total lunar eclipse, uh, or it could be the sun, sometimes a little hard to tell. One of the Chinese myths actually involves this guy here. Uh, he's not uncommon. He's uh, Tian Go, and he is the heaven dog. And he's constantly chasing the sun or the moon across the sky trying to eat them. And here he is, he's getting close. It's almost in his mouth right now. And uh, nothing to worry about though, because fortunately, every single time he tries to do that, uh, this guy right here, Cheng Shun, who was an expert archer and also the god of childbirth. I don't know how those two happened together. <laughs> um, but would always shoot, the shoot at the dog and scare him away from the sun or the moon. Uh, here he's got a little pebble bow and he's scaring the dog. Uh, surrounded by all the kids, of course. And it was actually a very big deal in the Chinese court. If you were a royal astronomer, your job, if an eclipse were to start to happen, was to do everything you could to prevent it. They were the ones charged with, let's start ringing bells, shooting off fireworks, uh, th you know, throw things into the sky. It was your job. It'll make as much noise as you can to frighten the canine away, essentially. They took it seriously. It, through cultural traditions of China, eclipses figure very prominently into the royal court. India has an interesting story. And this one I think is kind of cool. 
The demon Rahu. The demon Rahu uh, is both the mortal enemy of the moon and the sun. And the reason is, is because they caught him trying to drink an you know, um, immortality elixir. And the immortality elixir would have given him eternal life and made him a god. However, they tattled on him. They went off to uh, Vishnu, which is the uh, supreme being of all the gods, and tattled on him as he was trying to drink the elixir. So what happened was, is uh, Vishnu came, actually sent somebody, and they chop, chopped his head off. Now the elixir had only made it into his head, hadn't made it to his body. So with the head being removed, the body died. But the head had already tasted the elixir and it became an immortal, it became God. And of course it made Rahu very angry at the moon and the sun because they tattled on him and he didn't get to his full immortality. His body became the constellations in the sky and his head now chases the moon and sun around trying to eat them in anger. And every now and then he, ca he actually does succeed. And he swallows them. But of course there's no body to receive the sun or moon and it just drops out of the head and reappears. And that's actually, I think, a brilliant explanation for what you see during eclipses, right? You got eaten and whoop, it's back again. That's a great explanation. So Rahu, I think, is actually a really cool myth. It actually fits the facts really well. And of course, eclipses figure prominently into Western civilization and pretty much all over the world. They were always viewed as omens. Some are good, actually, believe it or not, and some are bad. Uh, Europe tended to be seeing things more in the bad light. Usually if there was an eclipse, uh, it meant a ruler was about to die, an important battle was about to be lost, some natural disaster was about to happen. China, if you saw a red moon engulfed in darkness, then a full sol a lunar eclipse, then that was probably foreshadowing famine or disease. Uh, but the Indians actually had a much better, more positive view of that. They believed that if you saw an a eclipse, get to the Ganges River and bathe, and that will actually help you toward um, your salvation, your uh, nirvana, your, your eventual uh, salvation, uh, which actually is a very positive way to deal with it. Uh, and again, eclipses tend to be death and rebirth. They tends to be a cycle. And this is more of the rebirth part. Well, they focus more on the death part. And I don't know how many people have heard this, but Columbus's life was actually saved by a lunar eclipse. It's, it's actually a really cool story. On his fourth and last voyage to the New World, uh, he left Spain in 1502. Uh, he took him a while to sail across the Atlantic, of course. And he, by the way, he still believed he was in India, in Asia. He had no idea he was found a new continent halfway in between. He was really bad at navigation. And unfortunately, after sailing around the Caribbean for about a year, his ships became so worm rotten from shipworms, from Trito worms, uh, that they were barely floatable. And so they beached them in the northern shore of Jamaica. And they were pretty much stuck there. They did send a rowboat for help. But for almost a year, they were stuck in northern Jamaica. And they quickly wore their welcome out with the locals. At first, the locals were astounded. They gave them food, you know, entertainment. But after a while, the lecture kind of wore off. And uh, it didn't help that they kept raiding villages and killing villagers. Uh, that did not endear them at all. That would be the deprivations part of that. And so in the end, they, they, they were getting ready to pretty much kill him and his men. They did not want him around anymore. And he knew he was in trouble. Fortunately, one of his navigation books, out of the two that he carried, actually predicted a lunar eclipse on February 29th of 1504. And that date was coming up. So he gathered all of the council, the, the various leaders of, of the native population, and he told them that if you don't cooperate with me, my gods are very angry and they're going to make the moon disappear. The next night, of course, as the moon was rising, a full lunar eclipse started to happen, and a blood moon happened. And it was terrifying. They came back to him and begged him to bring the moon back. He said, I'll think about it. <laughs> he retired to his cabin, because the ships were beached, and he took his sundial and flipped it over, knowing that that would time how long the eclipse should last. And when the sand ran out, he went back out at the peak of the eclipse and said, talk to my deity, and you know what? He'll give the moon back to you. And so that's what, of course, happened. The moon reappeared. And uh, the next day, they brought food, and they did everything they could to make him happy. And they, for another three or four months, he was there. And then finally, in uh, late June, a Spanish ship finally came to rescue him. And so a lunar eclipse actually did save Columbus, which is a really incredible tale. And you've heard this tale before. 
because this tale has been used over and over again in all sorts of literature. Do you remember uh, Connecticut Yankee goes to King Arthur's court? Does that story sound familiar? They picked the Columbus story out and used it. And there's dozens of other novels that have used exactly the same circumstances. That's why it sounds so familiar. Now Columbus was the first to actually do it. And for as all I know that that's actually what happened. But you gotta remember we are thinking, remembering what Columbus said of the story. Nobody ever got the native side of the story. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a really incredible tale. And I think it does show the mania around eclipses. Eclipses have a strong influence on people. Through, have throughout history. All sorts of things, banging drums, you know, making noise, trumpeting, uh, howling dogs, crying women, it's, it's all lovely. Eclipses are a very, very important part of human culture. Um, we've tried to explain them. We have all these myths about it. But in the end, it's a very obvious thing that you cannot miss. When it happens, you notice it. And I've been talking about lunar eclipses, but really I'm talking about both types because most cultures don't distinguish between the two. The eclipse of the moon and the eclipse of the sun, pretty much equal. In fact, it's usually the same animal, the dog. It could be the moon or the sun, the demon. It's still the moon or the sun. They're pretty interchangeable. They, they don't really differentiate pretty much between the two different types. In fact, the uh, Chinese word for eclipse, which is rishi, uh, just means sun eat. And here's the dragon trying to eat the sun. And so really, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses are pretty much on equal ground when it comes to mythology. Neither one has had more or less scary effects than the other. Now, having said that, let's talk about solar eclipses, because that's the one we're about to see. This actually averages two to four per year, more than the zero to three that, that lunar eclipses happen by. And that may be true, but they're rarer to see. And it's partially due to the fact that the moon only has a very small shadow. Only a small part of the Earth gets to see it. And it's usually only 50 miles wide. That's, about, that's it. It's a tiny shadow. Not many people in that 50 mile wide radius. And on average, any spot on Earth only gets to see a solar eclipse once every 350 years. So it's rare it, to actually see one where you live and not travel somewhere else. It's rare. You have, again, Cleveland's going to have to wait over 400 years before we see the next one. Three, so we're actually a little above that average. Some places it happens a little more often, especially toward the equator, but it's still rare. And by the way, remember, Earth is mostly ocean. Half the time the eclipses are over where nobody is. It's over the ocean. So you might have asked yourself this, because I'm showing all these nice little charts. And you go, well, you know, look at that. The, everything lines up nicely. Why is it that we don't see solar eclipses and lunar eclipses at least once a month? Because, you know, that's about the time it takes for the moon to go around the Earth is once a month. So why don't we see a solar eclipse every month? And why don't we see a lunar eclipse every month? Well, the answer is, is essentially a little bit of orbital mechanics. So why don't we see a lunar or solar eclipse every month? It's a simple answer. The moon's orbit's tilted by five degrees. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but that makes all the difference in the world. This tilt is why they become rare. If, they, if the moon actually went around our equator, we would see them every month, it would be no big deal. But because of this five degree tilt, what happens is, is there's only two times a year that they're really even possible. Uh, they're called nodes, and here's that five degree tilt. You can see it just keeps the same orientation all the way around, it's sort of a gyroscope sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't rotate with the orbit. It's always five degrees in the same direction. And it's only possible at these two nodes. And that's when the sun's and the moon orientation and the moon's orbit takes it right through what they call the ecliptic. The ecliptic is that plane that the Earth and the sun are in, uh, the, our orbital plane. And there's only two times that happens. If you go to the other sides over here, the moon's too high or the moon's too low. Either way, you're not going to get a shadow on the Earth or the Moon. And that five degree tilt is why it's actually a pretty rare event. And here you can kind of see a better thing. So again, it's only five degrees, but it makes a world of difference where those shadows fall. And so that's why it's actually a pretty rare event. When it could have been pretty common if it had only just been around our equator instead of at a five degree tilt. I will point out too, by the way, the Earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, which makes it even more complicated. And I cut that out of the talk by now because then people's eyes would glaze over and then stop listening. It's even more complicated. There is one other complication though I should mention. And that is, is that the moon's not a circular orbit. 
it's like most bodies an elliptical orbit and a fairly elliptical orbit at that. It turns out an elliptical orbit means it comes in close to Earth sometimes and then it goes way far away sometimes. At the closest point it's called perigee. Um, this would be this point. It's also traveling the fastest then. And then eventually it swings on out to apogee, which is farthest away, and it's also going the slowest. Basic orbital mechanics. But the result of this elliptical orbit means that the moon is not the same size. If you ever look at the moon and go, you know, it looks a little bigger tonight. Well, actually, yes. It can be 12% different in size depending on where it is on its orbit, according to us on the Earth looking at it. It could be this big, and it could be that big. It's a, a significant amount, and you can, I, I, your eye can't pick it out. It's a little tough to tell, and certainly when it's low on the horizon, it's magnified by the atmosphere. But once it's up ahead, sometimes you may notice it looks a little bigger, smaller than, than the last time you saw it at the previous month. And that's because it's in a different part of its orbit. And the result of that is you get a special type of eclipse that we're not talking about too much today, but it's called an annular eclipse. And it's when all of the orbital mechanics lines up, but the moon's out at apogee. And it's too small to cover the full disk of the sun. And that happens then is you don't get a total eclipse, you get what they call the ring of fire. And you get this really cool ring around it, which I still think would be pretty cool to see uh, if I had my choice. But nevertheless, it's not a total eclipse. It's not where the moon is perfectly covering the disk of the sun like we're used to for total eclipses. And so that's another little bit of complexity in calculation of, of the moon and when eclipses are going to happen and all that. All right, so let's talk about what we're actually going to see. So first of all, most of the time when you see eclipses, and in fact, I think everybody here was here in 2017 and saw the partial solar eclipse. And this is what we saw. We're not in the path of totality. And so you only see a chunk of the sun taken out. And that's what most of the people see most of the time for eclipses. That's what we saw in 2017 here in Cleveland. So the sun got bigger, took a big chunk out, and then it kind of got small again. It's still pretty cool, but not as cool as totality, which you'll find out why in a minute. So here's this year's uh, eclipse. Here's the path going along. And we're lucky we get 100% because we're in the totality swath. Now, if we live in Chicago, we're only going to get 95%. Uh, if you're down in southern Florida, you're only getting 50%. The further you get away, the less of the sun gets covered, and these are all partial eclipse territories. They're not total eclipse territories. And again, partial eclipses are kind of cool. I mean, they look like this, but, and I've seen quite a few actually over the years. And while they're neat, one eclipse, partial eclipse looks pretty much like just every other partial eclipse. 60% looks an awful lot like 40% to me, and even 70%, 80% isn't as much as more impressive than 50%. So when you've seen one partial solar eclipse, you've kind of seen them all. Now, a total solar eclipse is a different story. It's special, and it's rare. You probably had to make some effort to get there, or you're just lucky to be there. And it's a much more interesting view. So we're here, everybody else is here, and let's talk a little bit more about total solar eclipses. But before I do that, I'm going to show you a unique view of eclipse. How many people have seen eclipse from space? Well, there it is. There's the moon shadow on the Earth right there. It was taken by a uh, climate satellite, a weather satellite. And satellites are in a perfect place to see them. They don't have to worry about weather or any other things. And as long as they're looking at the Earth at the right place at the right time, they can see it. And here is one of the first ones I ever saw taken from space. This is from the Mir space station operated by the Russians. And it was back in 1999. And an eclipse happened over Canada. There's the Hudson Bay. There's that meteor impact. That's how I know it's Canada. Uh, that's a very unique circular lake. That's actually an old meteor impact. And that's what an eclipse looks like from space. And of course, now with the International Space Station, the ISS, they see them pretty regularly. They photograph them. Uh, if you don't see it, it's that spot right here. But it's not uncommon to view from space. And actually, they see them all the time. This view, I think, shows you something about eclipse shadows that's really important. This was over the Mediterranean uh, back in 2006. And what's important about it is, is the fact that it's not a really a circular looking shadow, is it? It's very elliptical. Uh, and that's important. Uh, this elliptical shadow actually has a lot to do with, well, the angle which the sun shadows, you know, the moon shadows coming in. 
And it's coming at a sh shallow angle, making it a nice elongated uh, thing. And it's the shape of the shadow and the size of the shadow that will determine how long an eclipse will last. And this is another special thing about the eclipse coming up. Is Here's that 2017 eclipse I keep talking about. Look at the size of its shadow. It's a pretty circular shadow and it's small. This is the normal type, you know, about the 50, 60 mile across type. Our shadow, look at the size of it. It's huge. And it becomes more elliptical as it gets to higher latitudes because the sun angle is, you know, as the Earth curves away, it's starting to create an elliptical shadow. And that's really important for why this is such a good event. There's actually a lot of things. Let's go through the list. So as I was saying, the size of the shadow matters. <coughs> size does matter. In 2017, the shadow was only 62 to 71 miles across. For this eclipse, 108 to 122 miles across. It's a big shadow, unusually big. Um, that makes it really important. And it's going to pass over a lot more populated area. One, just by being bigger, it's going to cross over more people. But this one's going over major cities. In 2017, only 12 million people were in totality. This year, 31.6 million people live right under the totality shadow. It's going through Dallas and Cleveland and Buffalo and all these other major, Indianapolis, all these major cities. So that, a lot more people have a chance to see this one. And it's going to last longer. It turns out, given the size and shape and the, the travel thing, that this one um, is going to last up to four and a half minutes if you're in Mexico when it makes landfall, coming off the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we're going to be a little less at around four minutes, but that's okay. That's a long time. Because in 2017, Carbondale, Illinois had the maximum time. It was only eh, two and three quarters minutes. So we're getting almost double eclipse time here, which is phenomenal. And there's another thing. So we're approaching solar max. These, we're in cycle 25, and the maximum's coming up in about a year. The Earth, or the Sun, is very energetic right now. And I'll get into more than that in a little bit. But back in 2017, we were in cycle 24 at the minimum. And the cool stuff I keep alluding to, that you can see, you can only see during totality, and it has everything to do with what the sun is up to. So let's look at that path again, with the eclipse shadow going across. Here it is with the peak times of the uh, totality. If you look at the chart here, this tells you the times. So the colors tell you it gets shorter, it's longest here, uh, between four, four and a half minutes. Gets a little shorter here, a little shorter, real short here by the time you get up to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, places like that, because now it's shooting really fast. It's going to be traveling almost 2,500 miles an hour by the time it gets up to these high inclinations, the shadow over the Earth. So let's zoom into where we are. Here's us. And you can see right here, Cleveland is going to have totality peak at 3.15 p.m. Indianapolis will have it at 3.10, further down, 3.05. Look at that, in 10 minutes it went from here to here. Uh, from Il Southern Illinois up to Lake Erie. It took only 10 minutes for the shadow. It's traveling at around 2200 miles an hour uh, across the landscape. And by the way, for those that want to do this later, I highly recommend it. So there's something, a uh, site out there called the uh, greatamericaneclipse.com. And they have videos, computer generated, of the shadow passing over various sections of the United States, Canada, and Mexico and this is a, just a clip that I took out of that video when it happened to go over Ohio, Cleveland in particular. And you could just follow the eclipse along. And it's taken from the viewpoint as if you were following the shadow with it behind you and the shadows in front of you. Uh, it looks kind of circular here because of the placement of the camera, but it's really a long ellipsoid shadow. You can see 3.15 p.m. for the peak. Three minutes, 52 minutes in duration. Varies a little depending where you are and 2,200 miles an hour. That's how fast that shadow is traveling. Fast. But it's 112 miles across. It's big, really big. And so everybody gets to see it for a long time. So everybody keeps coming up with these times to view, and everybody has slightly different times. This is why. This is, so they've done a lot of calculations on actual viewing time. And if you look at the graph here, you can see these little lines here. Like this one's 3 minutes and 56 seconds. Uh, this one here is 3 minutes and 40 seconds. And if you'll notice, there's a trend. The middle always has the more time. As you go to the edges, you get less time. And that's really what's going on. The best place to be for long viewing times is always in the center. 
Now, Lorraine's been making a big deal about, you know, come, come to us to see the eclipse. And they're right, for our area, they're gonna have a pretty long time. So they're right between the three minute 52 second line and the three minute 54. So let's call it three minutes and 53 seconds is what Lorraine's gonna have. But I will point out here in Mentor, both us and Cleveland are along the three minute 50 second curve. So we get three minutes, 50 seconds. So we get Lorraine's longer, they get three minutes and 53 seconds. So three more seconds of eclipse. But nevertheless, this gives you a good time. And again, by the way, all this material is out there. Uh, if you go out there, this is again, Great American Eclipse, you can find all these charts and graphs. You know, and you can actually find out where, if you're on the map, you can tell exactly how long that eclipse is gonna last for. And everybody's gonna have a slightly different time depending where they are in the region. So what are you actually going to see? Standing on the ground, um, what does a total eclipse look like? And this is where it actually gets fun because total eclipses are not like partial eclipses at all. They're much more fun to see. I've seen two now and uh, going for a third. And this is what you kind of see. This is actually a great photo, I think. It really gives you a feel. It's kind of subdued light. You can see the people standing looking at it. It's not quite in totality yet because there's still a little bit of sunlight visible. But of course, the first thing you're going to notice is the sky is going to darken. It, it's actually going to look like dusk or dawn noticeably looks darker because the sun's being blocked. And the other thing you might notice, and I noticed this the first time I saw a total eclipse, the temperature is going to drop noticeably and the wind dies usually too. Just suddenly everything goes quiet, the wind drops and you feel a chill kind of descend on you. The temperature notice lift, you actually in the shadow feel the temperature drop. The other thing you'll notice is stars might become visible. The sky gets dark enough that you can actually start to pick out stars, some of the brighter ones which is really pretty cool. And birds stop singing, um, crickets start singing, that whole shift between day and night, they just kick in. They're like, hey, oh, something's on. My clock must be wrong. I better start or stop, depending on who they are. They start reacting to it. And so you have this very freaky, weird, there's a very unusual atmosphere. You could tell something is up. It's, it's unique. One of the things people don't talk about, but I absolutely love, I saw this on the second one, was this, these crescents. See all these little crescents on the ground? If you have a tree with leaves, and in early April that might be a little touch and go, but maybe you can find an evergreen or something like that. If the sun filters through during the partial eclipse portion, you'll see all of the partial solar eclipse crescents just projected out on the ground. It's a pinhole camera effect as the light comes through all the leaves and the trees and goes through all the little holes and nooks and crannies to get to the ground, you end up with a pinhole camera and it just projects all these crescents everywhere. It's, it's kind of weird. It, it's no, once you know to look for it, you're like, whoa, this is weird. But it's really cool, and if you get the opportunity and you, know, you have something like that, a tree near you or some bush or something, look for it. It's, it's a really neat phenomenon. And of course, this is what it's gonna look like when it starts. It's gonna start out as a normal partial eclipse, and you might even see some solar activity. Here's sunspots on the disk right there. Now, Having said that, you're looking at a fully exposed sun with just a little chunk taken out of it. So these things are really, really, really important. You cannot look at the sun or a solar eclipse safely without these glasses. You really need to get some. And they're everywhere. I hear there's some here tonight. I know the Metro Parks are giving some away. Worst comes to worst, go uh, onto Amazon. I bought a five pack or no, a 10 pack on Amazon because you know we might have a party later and everybody needs some glasses, right? So they're easy to get, get them. And by the way, if you have cameras and you're trying to take pictures, remember to put the filter in front, you don't wanna burn your camera out. These things are really good, they work. Um, I have heard some tales of counterfeit ones out there, knockoffs, so be careful if it's a little too good of a deal to be true, it might be. Check for the ISO and CE certs. All the legitimate ones on the side here will have the certs that they actually uh, meet. And I know people might be welders. You could use your welding glasses, but only if it's shade 14. Uh, any other shade, it's not gonna be good enough, you're gonna burn your eyes out. So, but if you have shade 14 welding glasses, that's fine, that'll work. But nevertheless, really important, can't emphasize it enough, get the glasses and use them. Because right up until totality, you're gonna need them. You're gonna need them to see the sunspot, you're gonna need them to see the disc slowly getting eaten away. Some of you may even have some left over from 2017. I have a couple pair from 2017. 
And right before totality, things get really interesting. Your clue that totality is coming up is when you see this. They call it the diamond ring. The sun is almost gone, except for one point, and it looks like a big diamond ring. Um, you still have to have your glasses on at this point. You're still looking at the sun. But eventually, it disappears behind the disk, stays behind the disk for whatever time it is in your area, and then it reappears on the other side of the disk. When you see the diamond ring again, the, eclipse, the total eclipse is over. So it travels from one side over to the other. But the diamond ring heralds its start and it heralds its end. And once the diamond ring effect is gone, you're gonna see these guys, Bailey beads. Now, the reason they're named after Bailey, a guy that first described them. He was not the first to see them, by the way. Alex Haley, the, the guy with the comet, was the first to describe them, but he didn't name them. Bailey named them, so he got the credit 100 years later. But nevertheless, you're gonna see these bright little beads, kind of like around the edge of the sun. Now what those are is that the, the moon is not a perfect sphere. It's very cratered, it's got valleys, it's got mountains, it's got all sorts of impact rims, things like that. And what you're seeing is the sun filtering through the valleys and being blocked by the peaks. And depending on the topography, you'll see different things at different places at different times. But nevertheless, Bailey beads are pretty common and they all have to do with the topography of the moon. And this is, by the way, where nerds get really, really crazy. So this is the cause of Bailey beads, this sort of surface with the sun totally blocked, but still little pieces just kind of barely making it through in the low parts. And we have mapped the moon in great detail. So this is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been around the moon many, many years, and has an instrument port called LOLA. Uh, it's essentially a laser altimeter, and the moon has been mapped in, in topography to incredibly high detail. We know where every mountain, every dimple, to well, with a few meters resolution anyway, is. Because of that, people that love eclipses have fed that data into computers, they've modeled it, and they can actually predict what you can see a very rare phenomena. It's called the double diamond ring. And it looks like this. It used to be, before all this fancy technology, you just had to be at the right place at the right time and it was pure blind luck. And essentially what it is, is an extension of Bailey beads, but it's where two big pieces of light make it through uh, right before the sun disappears behind the, the moon. This is the computer model result. These blue, the green lines, are where you're gonna see a double, very likely it's going to see a double diamond uh, at the start of the eclipse. And the blue lines are at the end of the eclipse. And the thicker the line, the more prominent the effect. So these thin lines, eh, touch and go. But these nice thick ones here, so you can actually, if you're sitting on this line and you're looking right as it happens, you should see a double diamond, uh, diamond ring. And here at the end of the eclipse, the blue ones here, and you can see it travels pretty much right along the lakefront here. You've got a good chance of seeing a double diamond. Uh, and I guarantee you, the hardcore astronomy photographers are out there with their cameras set up at exact GPS coordinates where those lines are put, hoping to catch that effect. But this is, this is how eclipses work these days. We've got so much technology, they're no longer a mystery. We know all about them and we can predict rare phenomena, which I think is kind of cool. Of course, I'm an engineer and this is cool. So one of the things you're gonna see once totality starts, um, look for it, um, you should be able to see what's called prominences. So that's these things right here, these little red things kind of sticking out. They're large bright features, they kind of extend out from the thing. They're anchored on the sun's surface, which by the way is called the photosphere, and then they extend out into that outer atmosphere beyond the sun, and they're called corona. Uh, that's the corona, the outer atmosphere. And they don't look very big, do they? But those are solar flares, essentially, or they potential solar flares, I should say. Sometimes they're called filaments, but this is what they look like. If you have a fancy satellite that can look at the sun, they're huge magnetic field lines with plasma trapped in them. And they, they erupt from the surface and they loop around and dive back into the surface. One of the mysteries of solar science that they're still working on, although they now have a much better handle on, is one of the things that's really weird about the sun. You'd think, oh, the surface of the sun's really hot. No, it's not. It's actually really cool, surprisingly cool. It's only 63,000 degrees Fahrenheit, only. But these prominences 
are up to 2 million degrees Fahrenheit. Extremely hot. And in fact, the whole corona is in the hundreds of thousands of degrees. The atmosphere is hotter than the surface, even though the heat's flowing from the inside out. And they've never really quite understood that. Turns out it has a lot to do with magnetic field lines, entanglement, and adding energy to the system. I won't get into that. But nevertheless, they're really impressive. And even though they look small, here is a scale view of one of them. There's one erupting. And oh, look, there's the Earth for scale comparison. These are monstrous uh, charged plasmas following field lines. And sometimes they just hover there for days or weeks and then either collapse in the sun or blow away as a solar flare. And they're big. So if you can see even just sticking out a little bit from the sun, keep this perspective in mind. It's huge. It's absolutely enormous. And I've alluded to it. We are approaching solar maximum. The sun is getting more energetic every day and will be for the next year or so. So back in 2007, we were at the solar minimum. Here's an energetic going down to less energetic, back up to more energetic. We were in cycle 24. And you can see the 2017 eclipse, we were approaching the minimum. The sun was not that active. Prominences weren't going to be seen very often. Streamers, all this other stuff that's going to be happening. But now we're approaching solar maximum. The sun's going to be putting on, we think, a pretty good show. And it should peak sometime in late 2024 or early 26, 2025 anomaly. They never quite can predict. In fact, I say it's a 12-year cycle here. Eh, some people say 11-year cycle. It's very hard to predict. You can actually see, here's the long-term view down here. Sometimes it's more energetic, sometimes less. The spacing varies a little. But essentially, it's the sun flipping its poles magnetically. It does exactly what the Earth does. The Earth takes hundreds of thousands of years to do a pole flip magnetically. The sun does it every 12 years on average. And that's what's happening. The, the, the magnetic field lines get more and more tangled. Pole flip happens. Everything untangles, goes down to a minimum, and then starts to retangle again and then pole flip again. That's really what this whole cycle is about. But nevertheless, we're approaching prime viewing period. Prominences should be everywhere. Should be a lot of them. You can see some right here, up there. And the other thing you're going to see during totality is something that you can only see during a total solar eclipse. And that's a corona. The corona is that hot atmosphere I was talking about, the one that's strangely hotter than the surface of the sun. And it's only visible during total solar eclipses. Uh, there's no other way to study it. It's the source of the solar wind. It's the source of all the solar flares that cause aurora and everything like that. And the only time we can really look at it well is with an eclipse. And that's why there's people that actually travel all over the world watching eclipses, because they're studying corona. Now, the corona, nobody had any idea it existed until they started studying solar eclipses in detail with a scientific mindset. And you can see here's a drawing from 1806 where they draw this halo around the sun. And it was discovered that, hey, there's an atmosphere to the sun. It's still there. Nowadays, our pictures are much more detailed. They're not just sketches. This is taken with some filters, so you may not see exactly this. But you should see a lot of the features in more blurry detail. So what you're seeing here is the sun in the way, or the moon in the way, and you're seeing the sun's magnetic field lines coming out of the poles, and you're seeing the equator right here blowing out essentially the solar wind, charged plasma, charged particles just being blown out from the sun. And this is actually a, not too bad. This is actually a little disorganized. You can see some nodding here, nodding over here. Uh, but nevertheless, what we'll probably see is something more akin to this. Twisted magnetic field lines. It should look, uh, the, the crota should look kind of lumpy. Uh, it should look like a, a balled up string or something like that. It's all those field lines getting entangled, approaching solar maximum. And again, you're not going to see it quite this well. This is uh, by a group of people that travel all over the world. They're paid to do this. Uh, and they use solar eclipses all the world. Every time one happens, they're there with their cameras and filters recording the data so that they can watch the full solar cycle and the corona. And this is the science that happens during a solar eclipse. This is why people travel all over the world, scientists included. It's not just because it's pretty. They can actually get data you can't get any other way. And it only happened with a, total, a full solar eclipse. And so this is actually data from the, uh, the, the Sherpas. Uh, they call themselves the Sherpas because they're hauling their equipment all over the world. Whenever one's happening, they try to be there. 
Uh, sometimes they're even on airplanes because they're over the ocean. That's the only way they can see them. But nevertheless, this is the size. For us people, for us regular observers, we're probably going to see something more like this. But it's still pretty cool. You're going to see streamers, these kind of lines coming out. You're going to see clumpiness and disorganization, things like that. You're going to see prominences. Um, you should be able to see a lot of activity. And that's what makes this solar eclipse so special. It's happening during solar maximum. So for three minutes and 50 seconds, thereabouts, depending on where you are, you're going to have totality. Now you can take your glasses off then, but be careful. Because right when you start to see that diamond ring, those glasses better be back on. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you might start to see spots for a while or forever. This is also the end of the, the totality. But, but for almost four minutes, we're going to see some pretty cool stuff. And eventually, of course, it'll go back to partial and eventually finish out. But that will be the full cycle. That's what I would expect to see. But there is, of course, the, uh, <coughs> the thing in the room, weather. Um, it's Cleveland, and it's early April. So we have this weather factor, because we live in Cleveland, and weather's a thing. And uh, if we lived in Hawaii, this would not be a factor, or Mexico, but it is a factor. And one of the things that worries uh, people that get excited about eclipses is that <clears throat> this might be a problem. Uh, my brother-in-law, by the way, loves, he does astrophotography as a hobby. And we invited him to Cleveland. He said, ha, 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 no, I checked your weather. No, not even the top running. He has like five or six hotels all booked all along the path. And well, starting a week out, he's going to start checking the weather. And maybe three days out, depending on, you know, when he can cancel things. He's got to cancel all the ones with the worst weather and go to the one with the best weather. Uh, and he didn't want to come here. However, Channel 5, their chief meteorologist, he did a wonderful analysis. He actually looked back at 40 years worth of data for Cleveland and Ohio along the eclipse path. And 40 years worth of data, he said that on an April 8th afternoon, we're about 60 to 80% on average going to have cloud cover. Now that doesn't mean Cloud cover all the time, it means could be partially cloudy, partly sunny, depending on your point of view. But on average, it's going to be 60-80% roughly for Northeast Ohio uh, for cloud cover. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean you're not going to be able to see some things. You're just not going to see a bright blue sky. Of course, he also warned, we could have a bright blue sky on that day too. I mean, there's always that other 40 to 20%, right? So is the glass half empty or half full? I don't know. But nevertheless, there is that possibility. Uh, there is some good news, by the way. For all of us that live pretty close to Lake Erie, we actually have a better chance of seeing it than people inland. So we have a 60 to 70% cloud coverage if you just narrow down to around Lake Erie uh, versus along the totality path inland, 80 to 90% cloud cover. So actually worse from based purely on historic data. Nobody could predict the weather that far out. We won't really know until probably three days out at best. And really, we'll know on the day of, because that's yeah. what weather was. <laughs> this is the map he came up with, by the way, which I think is very cool. So here's that bubble of better weather around actually all the Great Lakes. Um, this darker stuff here is that worse weather inland. And then it goes, kind of reverts back to pretty much us all the way through Indianapolis. It doesn't get better until down here. But I'll point out, this is still 50 to 60% down here. So, <laughs> the weather will be what it'll be, and we'll just have to deal with it. And even if it's partly cloudy, partly sunny, uh, you should still be able to see something. If nothing else, it'll just get dark, right? So there's another weird thing, and I don't know if people, if this occurred to them. I keep talking about the moon perfectly covering the sun. And it's true. The moon happens to be exactly the same size as the sun in apparent size to us on Earth. And that's an awful weird coincidence, isn't it? I mean, wow, what, what are the chances of that? Well, it turns out it wasn't always that way. So let's go back to the beginning again, that collision. You know, uh, Thea comes together, hits Earth 1.0. They create that spray of material, everything recoalesces, the moon forms, Earth reforms. At that point, the Earth rotated once every five hours, not every, every 24 hours. 
um, the Earth was spinning very rapidly. In fact, one of the, the points of evidence for this collision is that the Earth has an unusually high angular velocity and momentum, where all the other planets that don't have moons have a much slower one. Because as things naturally form and coalesce in the solar system, you can only get so much gravity and things spun up, especially with loose clouds. We have a very high angular momentum, and the Earth went around once every five hours, which is about as fast as you can go without flying apart for the size of the Earth. So that's actually one of the, the trails of evidence that this collision did happen. And the moon was only 14,000 miles away, not the 250,000 miles away it is now. It's now 17 times further out than when the Earth moon were first formed. And by the way, if you're a dinosaur geek, that means dinosaurs saw a bigger moon. I mean, think about it. They, the moon was much bigger for dinosaurs than us. And what's happening is that the tides, everybody knows the moon causes the tides, that tugging back and forth actually causes friction on the Earth. And it's causing the Earth to slow down in rotation. We're now at 24 hours. Sometime in the future we'll be 25, and then 26. And because of something called the conservation of angular momentum, the only way to counteract this and maintain the total energy in the system is for the moon to go further away. And that's what's happening. The moon is actually slowly spiraling out about an inch and a half a year. Um, it's getting further and further away. And so the moon's getting smaller. And we just happen to live in that golden time period where it's just the perfect size. They could not have done coronal studies quite as well back in the dinosaur days because the moon was too big in the sky. It blocked too much of the sun's disk. But now we are at the, just the perfect time where we can actually study the sun, which I think is actually really cool. Now there's a downside. It is spiraling away at one and a half inches a year. And there will come a time in the future where the sun or the moon is too far away and it will no, no longer be able to block the full disk of the sun. Essentially, it will become an annular eclipse all the time. So people have done that calculation. And that's about uh, 600 million years out. So see it now, because in 600 million years, it ain't possible anymore. All right, thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>